Good morning, everybody. And good morning to those of you who are streaming with us. It is the last Sunday of July and a very quiet day in New Canaan, Connecticut. Uh, just a, a few words as we get started here today. Uh, today, we are beginning what will be five weeks uh, in the Gospel according to John. We are going to read together chapter 6 and follow the great, the great living bread discourse. And it starts with the feeding of 5,000. And so if you follow for the next five weeks, John will bring you into a very, very deep, deep and mystical, beautiful place about Jesus as the living bread. And as we gather here on this quiet Sunday morning, uh, we do so uh, in thanksgiving for the lives we have and in constant prayerfulness for the world and for all of our friends who are in need and of course prayer for ourselves too. So as we gather, let us sing one of the great, uh, beautiful, quiet gems of our tradition, Ferris, Lord Jesus. Thank you all for joining us. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Holy God, holy and mighty, Holy Immortal One. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, the protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy, increase and multiply upon us your mercy, that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal, that we lose not the things eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. 
A reading from the second book of Samuel. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David said Joab and his officers and all Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. So David sent messengers to get her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself after her period. Then she returned to her house. The woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab said Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab and the people fared and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. Uriah went out of the king's house and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. When they told David Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, you have just come from a journey. Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, the ark in Israel and Judah remain in booths, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and to lie with my wife? As you live, as your soul lives, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to Uriah, remain here today also and tomorrow. I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day. On the next day, David invited him to eat and drink in his presence and made him drunk. And in the evening, he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of the Lord, but he did not go down to his house. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him so that he may be struck down and die. The word of the Lord. The psalm today will be read by the whole congregation, uh, alternating by whole verse, beginning on the lectern side and followed by the pulpit side, led by Father Peter. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. All are corrupt and commit abominable acts. There is none who does any good. The Lord looks down from heaven upon us all to see if there is any who is wise if there is one who seeks after God. Everyone has patented their face. All alike have turned bad. There is none who does good. No, not one. Have they no knowledge, all those evildoers, who eat up my people like bread and do not call upon the Lord? See how they tremble with fear, because God is in the company of the righteous. Their aim is to confound the plans of the afflicted, but the Lord is their refuge. Oh, that Israel's deliverance would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, Jacob will rejoice and Israel will be glad. A reading from the letter to the Ephesians. I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God, Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord.
This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. And when he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for all these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, and so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. They filled 12 baskets. And when the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to take him by force and make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, the disciples went down to sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. And when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. And then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. The Gospel of the Lord. May I speak to you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. So as you just heard, today's gospel includes Jesus' feeding of the 5,000, his miraculous multiplication of five barley loaves and two fish. And now, unfortunately, what you are stuck with is a multiplication of words. Uh, but I promise you I will not feed you 5,000 words, maybe more like 2,000, hopefully a bit less than that. But today I do want to talk about the two miracle stories in the passage, of course, the feeding and Jesus' walking on the water, because they are more than just supernatural feats that we may or may not believe in. According to the Gospel of John, they are signs. This is what John consistently calls Jesus' miracles. He calls them signs. They are signs of Jesus' divine power and divine identity, which can bring us to a deeper knowledge and love of him, and through this to satisfy the deep hunger and longing of our souls. But first, I do want to acknowledge that these stories can be difficult for our rational 21st century minds to accept. It might be enough of a challenge to accept Jesus' healing stories, his healing miracles, but feeding 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish, walking on water, how can these things be? Now, one relatively modern attempt to explain the miracle 
of the feeding is that the boy's generosity, because we have a boy in the story who comes forward with the five loaves and the two fish that Jesus takes, that the boy's generosity moves the whole crowd to share the bits of food that they had uh, sort of concealed, and in that way, everyone is able to eat. And I do see the appeal of this interpretation, but as far as I can see, it has no basis in the story itself, because there's no mention of, in any of the gospel accounts of this miracle, of people offering up uh, the hidden food that they had brought along. So for me, I, I think it's better to let the story confront us, even with all of its difficulties and strangeness and seeming implausibility. Miracles such as this one and of the walking on the water, they, they tend to divide people into two camps. In the first camp we could call rationalists. In the second camp we could call literalists. And rationalists tend to be bothered by the seemingly irrational or mystical or supernatural uh, elements of Christian faith and scripture and uh, attempt to sort of explain these things away or just sort of cut them out entirely. Uh, a great example of this is Thomas Jefferson, who literally took a razor blade to the pages of the gospel and removed everything supernatural or just weird. And so you end up with an account of who Jesus was that has no virgin birth, no miracles, no feeding of the 5,000, no walking on water, no resurrection. You're just left with a teacher who gets crucified. Okay. Um, the, the rationalist approach, again, has a certain appeal that I do understand, but I think the problem with it is that it takes away the mystery. And therefore, I think it takes the life out of the whole thing. And there's perhaps no mystery then that um, churches or religious movements, uh, such as you know, Thomas Jefferson's deism, for instance, uh, that adopted a, a too rationalistic or quote-unquote scientific approach, they lose their spiritual power. There's not a lot of spiritual vitality in that place. In the opposite camp are uh, literalists who tend to sacrifice intellectual honesty in order to preserve their sense of the Bible's meaning and integrity and try to accept everything in the Bible in the most literal form. Uh, a good example would be, you know, insisting on seven 24-hour periods uh, of, of creation from, from Genesis, a literal reading of Genesis. But there's a big price to be paid for this. It leaves, tends to leave people who hold this attitude uh, kind of closed off to reason, to science, uh, to today's world, and often ends up in a sort of intolerance and even hostility towards different points of view and the people who hold those different points of view and forecloses on the possibility of seeing into the deeper meaning of the scripture, uh, the stories of scripture. A biblical interpretation in the early church uh, avoided these extremes and their pitfalls. It was multi-level. It saw that scripture had layers of meaning. It had historical meaning. It had moral or ethical meaning, and it had spiritual and uh, spiritual or mystical meaning, and all are important and valid. And I want today to look at the spiritual or mystical content of these miracles, that is to approach them symbolically, and for this I am very much indebted to the work of the Jungian analyst and Episcopal priest John Sanford, um, who was an expert in symbols, just as Carl Jung was. And after all, as we have seen, the Gospel of John calls Jesus' miracles signs. They are symbols. Uh, they point beyond themselves to divine reality. And I think looking at the miracles in this way uh, allows us to perceive and encounter their spiritual power without getting stuck on the questions of historicity or the plausibility of miracles. So to start with uh, the feeding of the 5,000 and the large crowd, of course, that 5,000 people is. Uh, the crowd is hungry, of course, and this could be seen as a symbol of the spiritual hunger of humankind. Because there is a huge spiritual emptiness in the human race, if you haven't noticed. We tend to think that we will be satisfied if we have the material blessings of life, if we have wealth, security, family and friends, physical fitness, the esteem of others, etc., kind of Maslow's hierarchy 
of needs. We think that if we have that all squared away, um, we will be content uh, in our, deep down in our being, but that does not really seem to be the case, does it? The emptiness in our souls, the spiritual cravings for nourishment that we experience, I think is seen in the various manifold addictions so prevalent in our society today, to substances, to smartphones, social media, etc. I think we also see it in our restlessness, the way that we sort of hop from one material pursuit to another. Too many of us just don't recognize that these are symptoms of a deep down longing within our souls for spiritual nourishment, for real food, for the bread of life. Jesus will go on to talk about how he is the bread of life in the coming weeks in John following today's passage. Now for the multiplication of loaves and fish. Well, these could be seen as uh, symbolic of the multiplication effect of spiritual power. That is to say that when we are in contact, when we are plugged into spiritual power, our hearts and minds expand. They open up and their capacities multiply. We seem to uh, receive or acquire new insights almost endlessly. We become much more in touch with our powers of intuition. And the horizons of our life, they just widen. They open up and we become fully alive. And our ability to taste and see divine reality, to have faith in divine reality, increases, multiplies. And this effect, this multiplication effect, is not just for us. Because when we are fully alive in this way, we have an effect on other people. And so it sort of spreads. Others are influenced by our increasing vitality and wholeness, often without us knowing it. And this is why, perhaps, the influence of great people lives on throughout history. And this, I think, is real power. And I think this is interesting, because a lot of people in our world are hungry, even desperate, for power. I think we see this right now, right, in our election cycle, in our election season. But so often, that pursuit of power, that desire for power, comes from a place of weakness, of emptiness, of insecurity, which makes those people very unfit for power if they end up getting a hold of any. But the power of God, which is the power of love, is what will really feed us and in turn truly empower us in the way that Jesus was empowered. Now the following story of Jesus' walking on water is similarly, similarly hard to accept for the 21st century rational mind uh, as with the feeding miracle. And just as alternative explanations have been proposed for the feeding, uh, so also for the walking on the water. And some have pointed out that uh, the, the phrase that appears in our English translation, they saw Jesus walking on the sea or walking on the lake, uh, could also mean that they saw Jesus walking by the sea, which would mean something like the disciples were actually quite close to the shore and what they really saw was Jesus walking on the beach beside them. And I can see the, the intellectual appeal of this because how, who can imagine somebody walking on water? But I don't think this interpretation really satisfies the soul, of both our own soul and that of the story, the soul of the story, because it's clear in the story that the disciples were confronted with something out of this world, something um, that we could call numinous. This word numinous was coined by the philosopher Rudolf Otto in his book, The Idea of the Holy. And this is a book that explores, tries to get at the essence of holiness. And Otto's conclusion is that the essence of holiness was to invoke in somebody who encounters holiness feelings of awe, wonder, and even dread. Awe, wonder, and a little bit of dread. And he called such an experience numinous. And this is derived from the Latin word for divine majesty. And anyone who has seen a ghost or thinks they have seen a ghost has had a numinous experience. Uh, there is a positive sort of uh, numinosity, such as when somebody encounters the power of God, uh, and a negative form, such as one feels, one uh, experiences when they feel that they might be in the presence of supernatural 
evil. I think another good example of this might be uh, from the Raiders of the Lost Ark. For those of you who have seen the movie, uh, the Nazis open the Ark of the Covenant at the end of the movie, and they have a numinous, terrifying experience of the divine, and it destroys them, which is what they had coming. Um, Fortunately, this is not what the disciples deal with in this story, but they do have a numinous experience all the same. It says that when they see Jesus walking on the sea, they are terrified. And the Greek here is very strong. And it, the Greek is actually phobia, which is where we get phobia. But Jesus reassures them and says, do not be afraid. And he wants them to know that they don't need to be frightened of him. They don't need to be frightened of his holiness or of his power. Because as we see in all of his miracles, in the feeding of the 5,000, and his healings, and everything he does, he only uses his power to love and serve others. However, there is a certain wisdom in the disciples' fear in this case. Because while we certainly don't need to be terrified or scared of God, we shouldn't be terrified or scared of God, there is an equal and opposite mistake that we can make and that people often do make, which is to approach the divine or the holy without a sense of awe and deep reverence and respect. We could call this a sort of hubris, a disregarding of the power of the divine. And on some level, I think this might be the error at the foundation of all human grasping after and clinging to power. It's sort of the arrogance in thinking that there is no greater power to which I am answerable. And this is what the Nazis did in uh, Indiana Jones, and it turned out to be a fatal error. Or it's the arrogance in thinking that whatever I'm doing must be right because God is on my side. And I think we have seen that uh, play out in American political life. In other words, as it says in Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That is, the beginning of wisdom is to know that there is a greater reality than myself, than my ego, and that I must respect and listen to it. And therefore, this experience of seeing Jesus in his divine majesty guards the disciples and guards us if we take the story to heart against the error of losing sight of who Jesus really is. And speaking of who Jesus really is, before he tells his disciples to not be afraid, he says something very interesting. In the English, it just says, it is I. Okay. But in the Greek, it is actually something much more simple, mysterious, and profound. All he really says here is, I am. It is grammatically strange and extremely important. Because this statement from Jesus, I am, is a revelation of his divine identity in a way just as much as his miracles are. Because this is a divine name. In Exodus, when Moses encounters God in the burning bush, Moses asks God for his name because in this time, in the ancient Near East, it was thought that every deity had a name and it was important to know the name if you wanted to be in relationship to this deity. So Moses asks, well, what is your, what is your name? He thinks he's talking to one God among many gods. And God's answer is, I am who I am. And then he says, go tell the Israelites that I am has sent me to you. Which is to say that God is the absolute being, unconditioned, eternal, without beginning, without an end. He simply is. And shockingly, Jesus says that this is who he is. Later in John chapter 8, in a dispute with the Pharisees, one of very many that Jesus has, Jesus says to them, before Abraham was, I am. The signs, the miracles in this story and throughout Jesus' ministry, they all point to this, to open the eyes of our hearts to the divine majesty and radiance of Jesus and to bring us into communion with him. The stated purpose of the Gospel of John is that we may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and through believing, have life in his name. And so perhaps instead of trying to fit these stories of miracles and the supernatural into our small human paradigms of what is and what isn't possible, perhaps we can instead receive them, take them in, in all their mystery, and receive the spiritual food 
life and power that they can offer us. Amen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. We give thanks for all the blessings of this life, especially for the marriage of Whitney Mills and Max Buckley on July 20 and the marriage of Daniel Chen and Evelyn Lukes, daughter of Deb and Eric Lukes, on July 27. We rejoice that the Episcopal Church prepared and supported the 11 women ordained as priests this day 50 years ago in Philadelphia. Remembering how Mary Magdalene was apostle to the apostles as the first messenger of Jesus' resurrection, and as Mary and Martha exercised their diverse gifts in your service, we give thanks for the gifts women bring to every order of ministry, for the sake of the gospel and for the good of the whole church. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, especially Frederick, Cindy, Bob, Sophie, Mary, Kim, Peter, Kathleen, Joy, Jim, Rachel, Lulu, George, Steve, Tom, Bob, Dave, Marion, Beth, Tim, Caden, Muriel, Elizabeth, Blake, Dan, Bunny, Julia, William, Marianne. Give them hope and courage in their, in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled, remembering especially Cleet W. Harrison, brother of Chandler Kenny. We pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom 
Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. O Lord, our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Good morning, everybody, and good morning again to those who are streaming. Look who I have with me here. Uh, 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 today is a, a special day. Uh, it is, as you heard in the prayers of the people, the celebration of the 50th anniversary of ordination of women in the Episcopal Church, uh, and I've invited uh, Reverend Elizabeth to say just a word about that so that we can have context for something that we take as completely normal, but it was not always normal. Right, yeah, I, it, it was not normal, and it's still not totally normal. Uh, 50 years in, I, I think we're blessed to be in a church that can take it for granted that we have women at, at any altar where you visit an Episcopal church uh, in most dioceses. Um, but I think if you, if you travel further than you might um, around the world in the Anglican Communion, it's, it's very much still controversial and divisive and not totally uh, universal, so the struggle for women, you know, in all the ranks of the church is still alive and not yet achieved. And um, there's a documentary called The Philadelphia Eleven, and it's out currently, and it's been showing all over the different dioceses of the Episcopal Church. Um, and I saw it with Jill and Syra about a month or two ago, and it was very moving. And I, I, did, I have taken it for granted that I'm, I was ordained and my struggle was personal, it wasn't political, there was no, nobody throwing things at me or calling me names on my way to the, the altar to be ordained. But when the first 11 women were, you know, felt deeply called to become priests in the, in the Episcopal Church, um, they received multiple death threats and all sorts of um, abusive uh, epithets. And, you know, it was a huge struggle for years to, to come to that point. And uh, so it was really a moving documentary to watch and to also see that it was uh, a lot of people from all different margins um, coming together to support the raising up of women's call to the priesthood and include gay people and include especially black people. And in fact, the church in Philadelphia where the first ordination took place was at a black church uh, led by a black rector who opened up his church to have this happen. And so that alone just really took my breath away that we don't remark on that aspect of this event as much as we do about the marvel of women being ordained. But I think all of it points to the idea that John preached about, that there are miracles and signs that Jesus works throughout the Bible, the, the New Testament, and um, they certainly didn't stop in the New Testament times. And, and we um, don't always recognize things that are an actual miracle in our time, but they are all signs to the surprise that God you know, the surprising ways in which God acts, and we're not always prepared for them, and we don't always receive them well. So I'm grateful to be in this church and to be especially in this particular parish, and I feel the, the great responsibility of, um, you know, making way for 
all of us to experience God in, in the ways that God wants to work. So thank you. Thanks thank for having you, thank me. You. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. 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 Uh, super beautiful, and thank you for your sharing of your thoughts and with your ministry with us. Also, uh, speaking of super beautiful, uh, yesterday was uh, uh, Jack and Lynn Donahue's 56th wedding anniversary. I just saw Lynn in the back going, oh no, I can't believe he's saying that, uh, and how great, uh, only 56 years. Uh, I hope that you'll greet them at, yes, yes, thank you for, for that, yes. Uh, I hope you'll greet them and congratulate them at the world's greatest coffee hour. And thanks again to Paul and Gwen Reese and Faith Shepherd and Emily and James Morgan who are uh, working to put the coffee hour on. When I was making my notes this morning, uh, Jill Sakula said, how about that for a church name, Faith Shepherd? Uh, I've been calling Faith Faith for years and never thought about that, but how wonderful. Uh, also, there is a vestry meeting and uh, that will be at 11.45 in the youth room and today we are inviting the finance committee and the investment and endowment committee as we take a look at the audit. Uh, in addition, there's so much more. You can see that uh, online or in your order of service, but it's time for Holy Communion. We'll have Holy Communion around this altar. I remind you that you may receive the host uh, in your hands or in your mouth. And I remind you also that if you do not wish to participate in the life of the chalice, you can cross your arms for a blessing and that we also have gluten-free hosts. Now walk in love as Christ has loved us and given himself an offering and sacrifice to God. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. 
God of all power, ruler of the universe, you are worthy of glory and praise. At your command, all things came to be, the vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, the planets in their courses, and this fragile Earth, our island home. From the primal elements, you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the rulers of creation, but we turned against you and betrayed your trust, and we turned against one another. Again and again, you called us to return. Through prophets and sages, you revealed your righteous law, and in the fullness of time, you sent your only son, born of a woman, to fulfill your law, to open for us the way of freedom and peace. And therefore, we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, the prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all those in every generation who have looked to you in hope to proclaim with them your glory in their unending hymn. Father, we who have been redeemed by him and made a new people by water and the Spirit, now bring before you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread, said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his friends, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, gave thanks and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering now his work of redemption and offering to you this sacrifice of thanksgiving. Lord God of our fathers and mothers, God of Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob and Rachel and Leah, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, open our eyes to see your hand at work in the world about us. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal. Let the grace of this holy communion make us one body, one spirit in Christ, that we may worthily serve the world in his name. Accept these prayers and praises, Father, through Jesus Christ, our great high priest, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit, your church gives honor, glory, and worship from generation to generation. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Alleluia, Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. The holy gifts of God for the holy people of God. 
Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Together, let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the light of God surround you. May the love of God enfold you. May the power of God protect you. And may the presence of God be ever with you. For wherever you are, God is there, and all will be well. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be among you this day and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. <coughs> make disciples who live a deeper life in Christ, a more holy communion with one another, and a greater love for the world. Thanks.